Any reason, anything that you want to get out of today um, that I can maybe address from the beginning? Um, because I already have a prearranged slide presentation that will probably touch on everything that you're looking to get out of today. Um, but if there's anything specific that you came in wanting to know, please ask me now and I could probably address that at the beginning versus towards the end. As far as your own specific health concerns, sometimes it's hard for me to talk about that because of HIPAA compliancy and so forth. So I can keep it as general as possible and then I'll open up myself to questions at the end. Okay, and so like I said, I'm really passionate about this and trying to give you guys as much information as possible. And, and so I do get um, carried away with how fast I go. Um, but if I find it's a really important take home message, I'll go very slowly and emphasize that part and realize that this is something as a take home message. You, I wanted to make it interactive as well. So you have a questionnaire uh, of, of certain categories that if you can fill out um, that would be helpful for you to understand when I do a presentation here that that's an area of your brain if you have ones twos or threes or twos and threes or threes circled then that's an area of your brain that's declining and we'll find that certain areas of your brain will decline um, in different ways than than your neighbor and so that's why we want to determine in which ways they're declining and why they're declining and what most importantly you can do about it because your brain is like any other muscle so if I had a weakened bicep muscle and I wanted to do a bicep exercise to strengthen it it's gonna improve no matter how old I am correct the brain is the same way um, we have the different lobes of the brain that are responsible for different function and if we want to stimulate that function and help bring it back online we can do it so whatever anyone tells you with your brain decline and it's a result of you getting older may be true to a certain extent but it's not true in what you can do to help it and there's certainly a lot of things you can do to help it so just a little intro about myself I'm gonna have to use my phone all right <sighs> So I am a doctor of chiropractic for 14 years. However, I'm a family black sheep member of, of my family. So my family are all medical doctors and I am a lone sort of black sheep guy who hurt their back when they were younger and they wanted to do surgery on me. And I didn't want surgery and I thought I could rehab it myself and I have. And so since then, I've gone on to what's called functional medicine. Functional medicine is a new buzzword that you hear with doctors that try to address the problems that are breaking down in the body naturally. A lot of medical doctors are functional medicine doctors. And so we look at the body from a physiological point of view and from a biochemical point of view to try to fix some of the breakdowns that are occurring in the body. I've also gone through through um, diplomat in neurology, so I'm just have to actually write the, take the test. So I do a lot of nutritional work with patients, and then I do something called functional neurology, and that's going to be really important for you today as to what we can do to strengthen up some of the brain decline that's occurring. So, what's going to be covered in this in this topic today? Basically, we're gonna talk a little bit about how the brain works. I have a lot of information, so I'm gonna to try to get through it in an hour. I'm gonna fly through it, and I will stop on certain points and, and so that you get that. But basically, I wanna teach you about different areas of the brain and how it works. I also wanna teach you what the underlining causes of brain decline are. And when you learn what the underlining causes of brain decline, then you'll realize that taking one pill or taking another pill are not necessarily going to address the underlining causes of the problem. And so I was just telling Valerie at the beginning, medical doctors do a great job when it comes to acute conditions like heart disease or not even heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, um, traumas, broken bones, infections, um, a great job. But when it comes time to a chronic condition, a chrono-neurodegenerative condition, they don't do such a great job. And the reason that is, is a lot of reasons. Number one, it's pharmaceutically driven. And so that means take this pill for that, take this pill for that. And if you have depression, brain fog, um, sensory disturbances, balance disturbances, lack of joy, you have all these different symptoms, no pill is gonna fix all of that. 
Um, so, so that's a big problem. And also, it's also becoming an insurance-based model. Uh, you know, the doctors don't get paid as much as they get paid today as they did 10, 15 years ago for the same person that comes into the office. So I always ask you, if your overhead has gone up as a doctor and your staff and everything else has gone up, but you're getting paid less and less each time, does a doctor have more time to spend with you or less time to spend with you? They have less time, right? And in fact, it's a shame, but what I'll tell patients is, who reads your blood test? This is a trick question. So who reads the blood test, Judy, when you, look, when you go to the doctor? Um, she does. She, has, she does. She, she has who reads it before she does? I don't know. The computer, oh, yeah. right? Because you'll get a blood test and it will say laboratory high or it will say low, but it won't say anything else if it's normal, correct? So the computer reads it and makes it easy for the doctor to read it and say, oh, Judy, you know what, you're doing great today. There's only a low on, on the, um, maybe your vitamin D and there's a little high on your cholesterol. And I'm not too worried about it today, but, or maybe I am a little worried about it and let's get you to take this pill or that pill. But the, uh, yeah. the test that it comes with the blood test, it has a category where uh, it tells you it should be this like Correct. 100, Those, 200, yes. 200, and if it's more, it's right. wrong. Okay, so that's right. So, so that's, can read it you can read it yourself. And I'll present in different workshops. You said you wanted to come to a thyroid workshop. Yes. So in the thyroid workshops that I do in my office, I present the difference between laboratory ranges and healthy ranges. So laboratory ranges are the ranges that they averaged the year before on all the people that took that test in that lab. So it may be different from Milwaukee to Boca Raton. The ranges may be different. So if you are sicker than the average person that took the lab test the year before, you're told you're not normal. If you are not as sick as that person who took the lab test before, you're told you're normal. There's something wrong with that, right? Because what the problem is is that you, the people, number one, that take the test aren't always the healthiest. So if you still are not as sick as them, doesn't mean you're necessarily healthy. So there's a difference between healthy ranges and functional ranges. So one of the ways that a functional medicine doctor looks at your blood tests is by looking at the functional ranges. And we'll talk about a little bit about that today. Um, also, what can be done to maximize your brain's health through integrative medicine and functional neurology? Has anyone ever heard of integrative medicine before? Integrative medicine basically is like functional medicine. It's looking at all the different areas. And that's the problem with specialties nowadays. Is specialties are less specialized because they need to be more generalists. They need to know everything that's going on in the body. And sometimes this guy doesn't talk to this guy, which doesn't talk to this guy. And that becomes a big problem as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So again, I talk about this book. This is a great book, great resource for you. It gets into a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about, and I give this away as a gift at the end, so we'll tell you how I do that, all right? So let's just first talk about the difference between hard lesions and soft lesions. How many of us who are here today that have potentially decline in brain function has ever had an MRI or CT scan for their brain? for their brain and more often than not you're told that it's normal correct so there's the all or none principle you're either medical doctors look at triaging and making sure that nothing major traumatically is going on with your brain but if there's nothing there then you're told you're normal and that's again a problem because you could have some functional disturbances you can have brain fog you can have focus and concentration you could be not sleeping you could have mood disturbances you could be looking at your handwriting and it doesn't look the same like it did when you were you know 20 years ago but yet you're normal in terms of your of your of your uh, MRI in terms of there's no trauma yep that's exactly I think why everybody that's a question everybody would have if you had brain freeze or any of the things you're talking about, right? You go for an MRI. I, I haven't had one, but and the doctor says you're fine, but there's still the underlying symptom. So now, this like solvent for X. What is X here now in this problem now? What is X? The person has brain fog. Right. The test says. The test is normal. yeah. The test is sensitive for major. What do they look for? Like what is the, the, thing that the they look They're for? looking for masses tumors, destructions, tangles, any type of what they call a, uh, a, um, a glitch. They're looking so for a glitch. on the surface, everything is fine. Right. You, we're going to drill down a little bit and see That's, what, what 
you're leading me right to what we're talking about today, which is perfect. That's where we come into functional problems. So that's where we get into, you know, you may not have a mass or tumor or destruction in your brain. It may actually have atrophied a little bit. So if we measure the blood flow, there may be some lack of blood flow to the brain. But we don't notice that your coordination movements are off. You can't touch your nose when you touch, when you, when you close your eyes. You, when you balance, you're falling over to the left or right. When you smell something, you can't smell and identify it. When I touch your toes, you don't even feel me touching both toes. You only feel me touching you one toe. These are functional neurological exams that you can discern all these people that have been thrown out with the bathwater and said you're normal, but now we see functionally from a neurological point of view, you're not normal. There's some delays in your brain in the way that they're fun functioning. And that's where functional neurology comes into play. Okay, um, And so those are called subtle exam findings. And so um, actually what I like to do too, if you want to stand up for a second, we'll just do a subtle test. So stand up for me. And what I want you to do is I want you to have your hands straight out in front of you. And I'm going to watch you guys when you do this. So you're going to have your hands straight out in front of you. And very slowly, not yet, just watch me, you're going to come and touch the tip of your nose. Okay? With your pinky. But you're going to do it with your eyes closed. Okay, so I want you to do it very slowly. You're going to do both hands. You're going to start with the left slowly and then go to the right. Good. Good, keep going. All right, and then I'm going to watch you, Judy. Go ahead, do it again slowly. Okay, and then go. All right, and then let's see you, Maggie. Good. All right, so missing on that one, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Jake. Jenny, go ahead. Okay. Okay, and then Valerie. Okay, good, and then uh, Vincent. I'm working with a lot of good, all right, stop. <laughs> and okay, you can sit down, guys. I'm watching you, Mike. Good. All right, so we're missing on that one, right? Yeah. All right, have a seat. All right, so what we'll find is in that simple test alone, we're testing your cerebellum. Cerebellum is your little brain that's responsible for balance and coordination and spinal posture. So if I watch people out in the public and they're walking like this, they have cerebellar dysfunction. They have a lot of balance problems. I saw a lot of this when we got towards the end with patients. So that's called a ter terminal tremor. That's a cerebellar problem. I saw some of this too. So our cerebellum doesn't know, does not getting the proper stimulation. And when that happens, we're not gonna have as much balance. And the cerebellum sends information all over the brain. Sends it to the frontal lobe, sends it to the brain stem, which controls different functions too. So that's a cerebellar deficiency that needs to be addressed. What pill is going to fix that? No pill. All right, so let's go on to the next one. Nutrition, then? You're, you're, like, you're like asking me all these great questions, which I'm, get, I'm getting right to, which is a good, which is a good question. Yeah, I did. I, I did plan them. He, no, I want you to. Yeah. yeah. Is anything wrong by uh, having a very strong uh, sense of smelling? Yeah. I mean, I can, uh, and my hearing is pretty good too. Yeah. So we're gonna we uh, want to smell something that is burning. One of the one of the, away, yeah. one of the one of the temporal. From far away. Yeah. One of the temporal lobe. That's temporal lobe. So temporal lobe is responsible for smells for long-term, short-term memory. We're gonna get there in a second, and for hearing. And so when we have abnormal sensory fibers we're not we're not sensing we're not sending information to our brain very well it could be increased or decreased so a lot of the questions I'll ask a person that has a temporal lobe deficiency do you smell things that other people don't smell no 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 do, yeah. it's, it's something that is burning I was in a room and we were having all dancing yeah. and right away I smelled burning have you always had that or just more so no I, I I always had it. Okay, so I would. I, I right. smell the electric wires burning. I would. Ha I went and told people. And yeah, sure and sure enough, it was a, maybe you're a superwoman. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> take four or five baths a day. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah. So <laughs> that's a good one. Um, I would have to put the whole cumulative picture together. So we would affect, we would. I mean, I'm happy with it. It's good. Like it's good. It's, it, is, it is good. But if you're here at my seminar today, then maybe something's going wrong with other far parts of the brain. Okay, sure. All right. So let's talk about symptoms of functional soft lesions. Depression, anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, memory loss, brain fog, chronic pain and headaches, attention deficit disorders. In fact, I did a neurological exam today on a patient who came in for a thyroid exam and I was so concerned about her neurological exam today that I sent her for an MRI because I, I am expect, I'm suspecting a hard lesion because she had some signs that shouldn't have been there at all. And so one of the ways that I work up a patient that has brain dysfunction is through a functional neurological exam to determine where their deficits are and what areas. Um, can't focus, not enjoying life, not social, emotional, impulsive, lack of enjoyment and fulfillment, vertigo, blurred vision, spatial disorientation, balance problems. I get a lot of patients that say they can't go down the stairs the same way anymore. They don't have that coordination. That's a problem with the parietal lobe and we'll talk about that in a second. Weakness, numbness, tingling, spontaneous movement disorders, can't follow directions. So when I know patients have a tough time getting here, with, with it's not easy, granted, that when they have you know, a difficult time getting here, then maybe there's something going on with the brain and it's not getting the fuel, and we'll talk about the reasons why in a couple moments. Um, digestive problems, high blood pressure, Focus, OCD, mood swings, lack of motivation. Of those, those symptoms there, how many of us can identify with a lot of those symptoms? All right, so there's a lot of that going on here. All right, let's go on to the next one. How prevalent are soft brain lesions today? One in eight of seniors have developed Alzheimer's. One of eight children developed spectrum disorders. Dementia, 24 million in the world uh, to double by 20,040. Um, use of antidepressants and anti-anxiety anti medications are going through the roof. I mean, we see all these, all these commercials of people going on all these different mood disorders, and none of them are going to address the actual causes. What is causing these problems? And not even going to address how to fix some of these problems. And the number one cause of accidental deaths. So when you can't feel your feet or you don't have good cerebellar function and we're missing our nose and we're doing this, then that is more likely to have a fall, not being steady on your feet. And the big concern about that is accidental deaths. So in the very least, when our brain's not functioning and we're not able to balance, we're at risk for a fall broken hips, broken arms, concussions, and death. So that's a really important concern. What does a brain need? This slide you should asterisk all over again, and this is basically the topic of today's conversation summed up in one slide. This is what a brain needs to be properly, optimally function, and no pill is going to fix all of these things. Brain needs proper glucose, it needs proper energy, um, it needs proper oxygen supply. It needs proper neurotransmitter formation. It needs proper activated. It needs to be stimulated. And it needs to have lack of inflammation in the body. If you don't have these basics, no medication will help that. Um, as a show of hands, how many in here have high blood, uh, high blood sugar levels? Yeah, do we know? What's your blood, do you know what your blood sugar levels are? Below 200, that's good. <laughs> Below 100, okay, so, so here's, here's an example. You, you remember you mentioned that on the blood test they show a range? So the range that they show on the blood test is 65 to 110. That's the lab range. Um, the healthy range is 85 to 99. So there's a difference. So if I'm, say, 103, I'm told from the laboratory I'm fine. From a healthy range, I'm a C plus. I'm not fine. I can get some medical model is, Judy, you're not sick enough yet, let's wait till you're failing and then we can give you extra help. Whereas it should be you're getting a C plus on this test, let's give you a little extra help now before you start to fail, correct? So that's the difference between what's considered healthy and what's considered normal. So blood sugar levels, more often than not, you're insulin resistant. So you're not getting it. So if I don't fix the blood sugar levels in your body, we're not going to get the proper fuel into your brain 
And just like a plant that needs water and sunlight, if you're not getting proper water and sunlight, that plant's not going to flourish. Oxygen as well. I see a lot of times on the blood test, patients that suffer with oxygen deficiencies, red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, the size of the red blood cells, from a functional scale not from the lab ranges, from the functional scale, and they have absorption issues, they'd have B vitamin issues, and they're not delivering enough oxygen to the brain. In fact, I had a, 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 a vertigo case that I was working with, and they had done CT scans after CT scans and doing these ear tests and vestibular tests, and they had a functional anemia meaning they're in th not laboratory anemia, functional anemia, and we fixed that, and next thing you know, that went away. They weren't getting enough fuel to the brain. So sometimes it's easy like that, sometimes it's not. All right, next slide. All right, so let's talk about metabolism. I tell patients every chronic condition case that comes into my office is a combination of metabolic problems and neurological problems. And this sort of leads, Vincent, in what, what you want to, what you said is what causes these neurological problems. The last slide talks about it a little bit. You need proper energy, you need proper oxygen, you need proper neurotransmitter, you need to be activated, and you can't have a lot of inflammation. But metabolically speaking, you need to be able to convert food into energy. That's the best way I would define what an actual metabolism is. So think about metabolism is kind of like having an assembly line of workers. And, and here's one guy here, one guy here, one guy here, one guy here, and one guy here. And if one of those guys are missing, then you're not going to convert food into energy very well. And so if you're not absorbing your nutrients, if you have an infection, if you have um, a lot of inflammation in your body, if your blood sugar levels are too high or too low, if you have a heavy metal toxicity, you're not producing energy. And then all of a sudden, your brain's not getting the energy. And then all of a sudden, it fatigues. So the cause is a metabolic problem, and we're taking pills. It's not fixing the metabolism. All right, so metabolic problems means you're going to decrease energy, and that sort of leads me to my next slide. Which organ do you think consumes the most energy by far? Brain. The brain. That's right. The brain. So if that energy is not being produced, the brain is not getting the fuel that it needs, and the next thing you know, I have all those symptoms. Brain fog, focus, depression, lack of enthusiasm, you know, g gastrointestinal problems. So different areas of our brain respond to different, uh, are responsible for different functions. So the frontal lobe is the biggest part of the brain and it defines our personality. So sometimes we have changes of our personality. Um, executive decisions, so we make different decisions. Social behavior, we're not as, as outgoing. Impulse control, just sort of saying what's on the top of your mind and not having those social graces. Um, focus, so trying to watch TV and some other sound is going on in the other room and you, you're just like, quiet, I can't focus, you know? Um, this exam I did today with this patient, so she was the one that I sent for the, um, the MRI. What I have you do is I want you to look at me and when I wiggle a finger, just look at the finger that I wiggle. And then when I wiggle the other finger, look at it again. And then don't do it until I get you to move. And we were doing it, and she was all over the place. And I was like, the wait till I wiggle my finger. And she would do it again. <laughs> she's got a frontal lobe problem. Oh, right. Yeah, she's not able to focus and concentrate. That, that causes lack of, in, that causes, the frontal lobe is like the brakes. Puts the brakes on, on the gas pedal. And so if you can't put the brakes on the gas pedal, you're all over the place. Your concentration. So if you've lost that frontal lobe function, that's what you're going to see on a neurological exam. So the question would be, what do you do to fix that? Will you do certain things to help get that frontal lobe back online by doing brain-based exercises? Or you figure out why is the brain not getting enough fuel and you get oxygen and glucose and inflammation controlled and neurotrans... Does it start to make a little bit of sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the inflammation you're talking about is the inflammation in a brain? Yes. Like when somebody has like the flu, the brain... Is Great question. You're, you've read my slides. <laughs> so when we have inflammation in the gut, we have inflammation in the brain. You do? Whatever inflammation you have in the bloodstream goes into the brain. 
So let's, let's trace it back. Let's say I have a bad digestion. As we get older, we don't secrete as much stomach acid. We don't have as much um, enzymes to break foods down. So I eat a food like a piece of meat and some grains, and then all of a sudden, um, I start to feel bloated and, and, and constipated, and I don't digest it as well. Now all of a sudden, these particles didn't get digested as well, and they still have to be absorbed. And so now you've created inflammation. And that inflammation goes all over to your body. What is inflammation from a microscopic point of view or microscopic point of view? White blood cells. That's what it is. So now all of a sudden, you have these white blood cells in the, in the bloodstream that are, are sending chemical messengers and they're activating certain things. So now it goes into your brain and these white blood cells have activated your, your, your chemicals, inflammatory chemicals in the brain. So if you have fire in the gut, you have fire in the brain. It crosses over the blood brain barrier. Does that go for your back too? Like if you have a and inflammation it, of a disc? Correct. It goes wherever you may have pain. So if I have a back pain patient that I'm working with, I'm not going to help them unless I f affect in their entire inflammation all over their body. And that's how I kind of got into this. So, um, all right. So that's the frontal lobe. Anyone identify with some of those symptoms with frontal lobe deficiency? All right, so now um, other symptoms of frontal lobe is depression, anxiety, slow movement, mental sluggishness, poor impulse control, poor focus, poor so social behavior, poor handwriting, poor motor planning, poor cognitive learning, math and language. No pill is going to fix that. You've got to fix it yourself. You've got to stimulate that. All right, now let's talk about other parts of the brain. Temporal lobe, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Temporal lobe is responsible for hearing, for speech, for memory, for emotional responses, smell, interpreting sounds, tinnitus, ringing in the ears, can't hear due to background noise. Um, hippocampus is the area that will fatigue for people that have Alzheimer's. So it's the temporal lobe. What's that? The hippocampus is an area in the temporal lobe and it's responsible for understanding language, for memory, for secreting hormones, for your sleep-wake cycle. So I know if someone has problems in the morning, they have no energy, or at nighttime they can't fall asleep, their circadian rhythm is broken. That's your hippocampus. You probably have memory disturbances as well, and you're probably stressed out a lot. You have a lot of inflammation in your body, and you're on the path to Alzheimer's. Yeah, not good, right? Um, that's, that's that one there. Is that the hit the front part there? The temporal lobe is right here. Oh, that's, that's the temporal lobe. Um, so you can see it right up there. That's the temporal lobe. Frontal lobe, and that's the temporal lobe. So now we have symptoms of temporal loss deficiency, memory loss, hearing difficulties, tinnitus, insomnia, abnormal shifts of fatigue during the day, your circadian clocks are broken. So people that have energy when they first wake up maybe, but by midday they, they've crashed. Or you're doing okay and then all of a sudden you've, you find out something happened with your friend or your loved one or you hear a stressor and you're, you're crashed. You know, that's not good. That's a temporal lobe problem and that's an adrenal problem. That's a hormonal problem. And, and what pill is going to fix that? <laughs> not, not one pill. All right, and then dementia as well. So now let's talk about parietal lobe problems. Parietal lobe problems is right behind the frontal lobe, right above the temporal lobe. It's responsible for touching all touches. So if I touch you here, where do you feel that? Trick question. <laughs> In my... Um in your parietal lobe, awesome. In your opposite parietal lobe. So your right parietal lobe is responsible for your left side of your body. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's responsible for all somatosensory feelings. So when I have a patient that has peripheral neuropathy that can't feel their toes very well, they have a parietal lobe problem. Um, textures, um, cold, pain, sensation. It also tells you which way your joints are moving backwards or forwards. And that's why we have sort of a little more clumsy on our feet as well. That's a parietal lobe pro problem. This is that's an area of our brain that's just responsible for parietal lobe. It's called a homunculus. So we have more sensation in our feet, or sorry, our feet, our lips, our hands. So you can kind of see here, there's different, we have a very small representation of our map in our brain for our spine. 
we have a big representation for our hands, for our feet. So we have a, we don't see the, our body the way our brain sees our body. Our brain has more sensory receptors in our hands and our feet our, and, and our lips. Symptoms of parietal lobe degeneration, unstable in the dark or unsteady surfaces, misjudging where your body is so you're injury prone, can't recognize objects that they touch. That's a good exam that we do. You know, you can touch different things and you should feel like it feels like a cube, but it doesn't feel like a cube, you know. Um, you get lost easily. Uh, numbness, tingling, pain in different parts of the body all on the same side. So how do we know if we have these things? You do a neuro functional neurological exam. So you may not see it on an MRI, or if I do an exam on you and I'm like, oh boy, it's something else is going on, then let's get you going for an MRI. Once it's cleared that there's no hard lesion, then we do a soft lesion approach and we try to build those muscles back up. But not only do we try to build those muscles back up, we have to fix why those muscles are not getting the stimulation. Blood sugar, anemias, infections, inflammation, neurotrans, a lot of stuff we need to fix. And guess what? Um, like I said earlier, medication is only one dimensional and doctors have less time to spend with you to look at all of these things together. So when I do work with patients, insurance covers some of what I do, but it doesn't cover all of what I do. And that's because I need to spend more time figuring it all out. And so I'll go over that at the end, what you could expect in terms of what kind of out-of-pocket expenses you may be looking at too. I would love insurance to pay for all of it. But the reality is, is that insurance pays less and less, and, 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 and if you have a chronic condition, you need to put all the sides of the Rubik's Cubes together, and you need like house working on it and figuring out what's exactly going on with your body. All right, so um, what are some of the um, degeneration of the occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual... Yeah, visual floaters, degeneration of occipital. I had a gentleman here who was just leaving. He, he has um, glaucoma and he has some visual disturbances and he also has migraine headaches. So he can approach his, 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 his health by doing a massage and trying to stretch his muscles out, but he's losing information being sent to his occipital lobe. And right, because if, I'm, if, if you can't feel me do this, then all of a sudden your parietal lobe is dying on the vine. It's not getting the stimulation that it needs. And then all of a sudden, that wherever that goes to, goes to another part of the brain. And he could interpret that as migraine headaches. So your brain is one big receptor that takes in information. And if you put faulty information in, it's gonna send faulty information out. So yes, in maybe many instances, you can do a massage for him and he'll feel better. But if he's got brain degeneration, then we need to stimulate it. And guess what? Your muscle is, is, sti is workable. You can do it. Yeah. What is the stimulation? Well, it depends where the, lo where the actual deficiency is. So if, if you have a deficiency in your temporal lobe, what does a temporal lobe do? It's memory, it's smell, it's sound. So we want to do memory, sound, and smell. Do and you those exercises exercise and you build the track up. Correct. You, you build up the neurological pathway. You do it, you like you do it in the office and you also give home-based exercises. Physical exercise? No. Some of it is physical. Like for example, as an example of stimulating my cerebellum, on this side I would do something like this. And so what I'm doing is I'm focusing on my thumb as I turn my, my, my head. If I wanted to stimulate my temporal lobe on this side, I can smell uh, coffee, I can smell different senses that, yes? I, I don't mean to be, I'm asking, I think I'm just like dominating the class here, but as you person gets older, like when you're a teenager, you have these things, they're extremely sharp. Yeah. Right. I say this to all the, like to my nephews, you're Superman right now. Right. Everything is real sharp right now. Right. As you get older, do these things like, the, it's like they exercise. degenerate like you didn't like if you if you don't do the exercises you don't get the they neurodegenerate that happens to your brain too of course that's i mean all of us that are walking around the older we get the more degeneration we have in our brain my dad's 87 yeah i call him up right now he's in front of the computer working on something and he's as sharp like a tack always on oh, oh, tell, tell yeah. Daddy I'm working on well, yeah yeah 
you, what do you do? What are you trying to do here? You move it or lose it. You know, your muscle, you're either going to work. But here's the thing. I may only be doing bicep curls, but I also have triceps. I also have chest. I also have shoulders. So you may only be using one aspect of the muscle. But meanwhile, I may get your dad to stand up and all of a sudden his balance is off. So there's something called neuroplasticity, and you said a great word. You're developing a, a path. So if I don't cut the grass, and I used to walk in this path, eventually it's gonna grow, grow tall. But if I keep walking in that path, all of a sudden there's a pathway to go through there. You can develop pathways to the temporal lobe, to the parietal lobe, to the frontal lobe. You can develop pathways to all different areas of your brain, and the less you use it, the, less it, the more it's gonna degenerate. Or, and the more you have uh, blood sugar imbalances, oxygen problems, neurotransmitter, gut problems, infections, the more it's going to create lack of energy. Remember we talked about the brain needs energy. It's using the energy in those other places. It's using, it's, yes, oh, it's only going to certain places. Correct. I see a little light bulb go off there, Vincent. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. I just uh, want to get it clear in my mind. What is the difference from dementia and Alzheimer's? They're sim pretty much synonymous, yeah. Alzheimer's is the, the actual, um, the known diagnosis. Dementia is an older term, but it's a symptom, it's more of a symptom. Yeah, it's pretty much, yeah, it's the same. Um, all right, so next one here. What are different areas of the brain responsible for function? Cerebellum, we did a test on that. So that calibrates muscle coordination. It calibrates information from the inner ear for your balance in your eyes. It calibrates information for your muscles and joints before sending. So your cerebellum is very, very important. And we, did a te we just did one test to determine what was going on with your cerebellum. Symptoms of cerebellar deficiencies, blurred vision, dizziness, nausea, uh, poor balance. I have very bad cerebellar problems because when I was a kid I had ear infections and they would put tubes in and out of my ears. So I go in the car, I get motion sickness, I go in the, um, on a roller coaster and forget about it or, or a boat. And so what happens is I have faulty information from my ear going to the cerebellum. So then all of a sudden my ear doesn't send good information, my cerebellum is interpreting wrongly what's actually going on and next thing you know I, I'm not stable. So you can rehab that. What about sinus, chronic sinus? Sinus, sinus is more of an infection, more, it could, brain? yeah, it could, it could cause problems, lack of, inf uh, too much inflammation, and that circulates to the brain, and then it so will. you don't get enough oxygen in your brain? From sinus infections? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Um, it could cause yeah, nasal, it, does, it, it could. It causes my, I have to reach for my. Uh, yeah, mouth. it's a part of the clinical picture. And we would figure out what exactly your symptoms are and how they're manifesting and what all the different inputs are to, to help that. And neck and back problems as well for cerebellar deficiencies. Brain stem, here's a big one. This controls our autonomic nervous system. So if your brain stem doesn't get proper fuel and activation, you could have things go wrong with your body from a, a, an autonomic point of view. And so what does that mean? That means that your, your autonomic nervous system is responsible for your fight or flight, your sympathetics or your parasympathetics. That these two can't exist at the same time. And guess which one fires when we're stressed out? The sympathetics. So stress is not just emotional, but it's also metabolic and chemical as well. And so what happens is 90% of the cortex, the brain, the big part of the brain, is responsible for getting the parasympathetic acti activity working. But when we lose our brain, we have degeneration of that, of that neocortex, all of a sudden the parasympathetic activity starts to, 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 to fatigue and all of a sudden we're sympathetic all the time. And so what does that mean? We have high blood pressure, we have dryness of our eyes, and our mouth, poor digestion, headaches, like this guy who was here. His sympathetics are taking over. His brain is degenerating and it's not allowing the parasympathetics to, to, to work properly. Insomnia, fatigue, hormonal imbalances, sensitivity to sound or light, frequent urination, erectile dysfunction, low libido. Anyone recognize some of those symptoms here? I mean, this is, this is another problem as well. 
Uh, what causes the brain to de degenerate? This is a slide for Vincent, because he, he was going to ask me this two seconds ago. <laughs> um, blood sugar imbalances, stress, poor circulation, food sensitivities. So if you look on your sheet, I'm going to steal this for a second. It's called the Brain Health Nutritional Assessment Form. Okay, there's two pages to it. Each category is responsible. So let's, I want you to look at section two and section three on the Brain Health Nutritional Assessment Form. Section two and section three. How many of you have circles ones, two, or threes for that one? Okay, so if you have ones, twos, or threes in section two or three on the Brain Health Nutritional Assessment Form, then you have some sugar imbalances. You're not, mo you're not metabolizing sugar effectively, you probably have some insulin resistance, and you're not getting fuel to the brain. Guess what that can lead to? Temporal lobe deficiency, parietal lobe deficiency, frontal lobe deficiency, cerebellar deficiency, parasympathetic inability, it could create all these problems, right? Um, let's look at, uh, what do we have? Uh, categories, uh, wh where are we here? We'll look at one more. How about category four? Do we see any ones, twos, or threes for that? Okay, that would be, st that would be stress in the brain. So that creates inflammation. You're, you're at risk for hippocampal problems. Remember we talked about hippocampus? That's the area that's responsible for short-term memory, our circadian rhythm, our clocks, um, our, our hormones, Alzheimer's. So we need to address your stress, right? If we're gonna help you with that. I mean, obviously we're not gonna get rid of all your stressors, but we can help your hormones deal with stress better. Um, so that's how, so remember, you can't separate the health of the body from the health of the brain. And, and Vincent, you led me right into that, in that your gastrointestinal system, you have a good brain, you have a good gut. And I think it was father of Hippocrates, you know, Aristotle said many years ago, look to the gut and I can show you people that have a lot of problems with their health, basically in a nutshell. I don't think he actually said it like that, but you know, if you can help the gut, that's where the root of a lot of all diseases are generated from. And sort of the more we change, the more we're getting to back to that, to that era. Blood sugar imbalances, that was one of the reasons we talked about having um, problems, insulin resistance, hypoglycemia. There's also the problem of hypoglycemia. So I said 85 to 99. On the blood test, it's 65 as the lab. So I'll see a lot of people that have 72 and they're functionally low. That's going to cause a lot of problems with your blood. High blood sugars and low blood sugars lead to the same road. It's weird, but it leads to the same road. Um, High blood sugars, and that's what we're talking about, what will happen is creates a lot of inflammation or insulin, which causes excess tryptophan into the brain, which causes excess serotonin into the brain, which causes an increased uh, tolerance to serotonin, and then we result in fatigue, depression, lack of pleasure and reward. But let's look at low blood sugars. So what I was saying is symptoms of chronically high hormones are the same as symptoms of chronically low transmitters as well. Low blood sugar creates the same thing, fatigue, depression, low, so I don't want to get too scientific on you there, but basically the take home message is if you have high blood sugars or low blood sugars, it's going to lead to the same road. If you have high neurotransmitters or low neurotransmitters, it's going to lead to the same road. If you have high cortisol or low cortisol, high insulin or low insulin, whatever hormones are, are, are out of balance, it's going to lead to the same problem. Stress in the brain, it shrinks the brain. Stress is known to shrink the brain. It promotes inflammation of the brain and it breaks down that blood brain barrier. So we have a barrier from the outside. Think of our gut like a house. And if there's cracks in the windows, if there's mold, if there's a leak in the roof, then all of a sudden these critters can get into the house and create a lot of problems and damage. That's a barrier. So over time our barrier system breaks down because of inflammation. Inflammation is like a blowtorch. So I get a blowtorch and I put it to this TV, how well is that TV going to work? It's not going to work very well. So now all of a sudden you have inflammation and it goes to the brain. 
and it breaks down that blood-brain barrier too. And that's what will happen. Then we have biggest stress is not just emotional. So people say, well, I'm not under stress. You know, I, I have a happy family life and, you know, my, my kids are grown and they're doing well. That's not the only definition of stress. Stress is also if we have a bad diet. Or stress is if we have a food that we eat, that every time we eat it, we have a reaction to it. Or we have low blood sugar, or we have too much, um, uh, we have too much infections in our gut, or we have musculoskeletal pain. That's a stressor too. And over time, that's going to create the shrinking of the brain. Um, it degenerates the hippocampus, it shuts down the pituitary gland, and we talk about this in the thyroid workshop too. Brain circulation and oxygen. So how many of us have cold hands, cold feet, cold tip of the nose, cold toes? We know that's a circulation problem. And we need to get circulation into the brain. And um, I have a nice slide on here which will tell you um, some of the supplements you can take that will help that. Um, but anyway, symptoms of poor blood flow to the brain, low endurance, so you can't focus and concentrate or you fall asleep during a lecture, something like that. Um, cold hands and feet. Um, poor nail health, so we look at your nails and we see growth, fungal growth. So we, we, I look a lot of the times when I'm doing an exam on patients and I see bad nail beds. I know that they're not getting circulation to their toes. Then I know they're not getting circulation to the brain. So we got to improve that circulation. Must wear socks at night to keep warm. Weak nail beds and their nose, they always say their nose is cold. Causes of poor circulation, again, all these things, stress, high blood pressure, smoking. So it's a lot of things that we go over. Here's a good slide for you guys. Botanicals to increase blood flow to the brain. Something called feverfew extract, ginkgo biloba, herpazine, and vine protectin. And we, can, we sell that in a, in a supplement. It's called Neuro and O2. Um, you raised a great question, Judy. Um, exercise with oxygen to the brain is a great thing to do. I don't do it in my office because in the state of Florida, I'm not allowed to dispense oxygen. But there are, there are exercises where you can get an oxygen concentrator and help get oxygen to the brain. And that's very, very helpful. I have a sleep apnea. Oh, so you, yeah, so, I yeah. Have, I have, but I don't use it. In no, you use it just for getting circulation to the brain. Very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. Food sensitivities. Um, anyone know that when they eat certain foods, it creates problems with their gut? If they eat dairy, or you eat soy, or if you eat gluten. All right, a lot of people... Eat bread. Okay, so, so you probably have a likelihood that you shouldn't eat dairy also. But, but one of the things that we do in the office, which is not covered with insurance, is we do food sensitivity testing. And, and that includes against glutens, dairy, egg, soy, corn. If you are eating these things and you have a lot of inflammation in your gut, every time you eat these things, it's creating a problem. And then that inflammation goes to the brain and then I can rewind all my 50 slides and explain to you what that's going to cause. So what's the solution? The solution is to get off those foods that are creating problems. How many of your doctors have ever told you anything like that? Right? So how do you know? And that will be part of our workup. You know, if I do a workup and it looks like you're getting some kind of food irritation and that's a big part of your, your, your problem, then it's <coughs> worth the investment to know every time you eat that certain food, it's creating inflammation. Um, so foods, most common sensitivities that we see are gluten, dairy, and soy. So one of the things I'll always tell my patients is for maybe the first 30, 60, 90 days, get off of gluten, dairy, and soy. Uh, you know, it's tough, right? Here's the thing. I mean, what's more important? You know, your long-term health or eating gluten? You know, I mean, that's what it comes down to. And so sometimes what I give you, I give you a cold hard lesson at the end of this is, is that you got to make some changes when it comes time to helping your health. It's not going to be Jack and the Beanstalk. You take a pill, you wake up in the morning, there's a beautiful Beanstalk and everything's fixed. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes it's a matter of figuring out why this is happening and, and addressing those problems. I, I think that's what everybody in America and in the world wants. It's this one pill that you take. Right. And it makes everything... Makes everything feel better. Everything's better. Yeah. 
Everything gets even fine. Everything, everything, the whole world. Well, you uh, see the commercials that look like that—the purple pill running through the field, and everything looks great. I mean, that—that that, it's ironic because that's what they're trying to sell you on. The cold. There's, there's. I off. I, I read a little bit of placebo. Story. Placebo. There's, you know what? There's the, the. There's like the, the, the fantasy world and the cold hard reality. <laughs> and anywhere along that continuum, it gets more to the fantasy world. But the cold hard reality is that you need to make some changes and that you need to address some of the breakdowns that are occurring in the body. And then you need to stimulate proper activation of that area. And then next thing you know, you have 15, 20, 30 more years of active life that you want to live and you want to, I mean, it comes down to how you want time to live, one time to live in this world, one go around this world, you know, Know? Do you want to live in confusion and depression and pain or and eat your gluten or do you want to get off of gluten and do things that you you, can't, you haven't done before? I mean, that you're here because you want to improve the quality of your life and you don't want to do it based on having it. At the end of the day, even if there was a magic pill, this is here's an exercise for you guys and just close your eyes for a couple, two seconds and I want you to think of two things that you could do right now to be more healthy. Just two things you could do. Exercise. Okay. Dancing. Okay. And I open up your eyes. Vincent, what did you have? Two things you could do to be more healthy. I got away from the stress. The st I, was in a, I, I worked for a financial firm for 35 years. All right. I had the stress and I got away from it. Okay. So. And the memory loss, the, my memory started to come back and I got away from the good. problem. Okay, good. So removing yourself from the problem, Stress, right? Yeah. And maybe other people thought I could eat healthier. I can, you know, not eat. The How many of us thought I could take more pills? <laughs> Two more things that I could do to be healthy. No, right? So even if there was a magic pill, we know inherently that it's not a permanent solution. It's not something that you think of right away that's going to make you more healthy. Yeah, and I would, I would think getting away from what the cause of the problem is. is yeah. The, really, you know, the fix the symptoms. Right, right. So that's why I use that as a visualization. That we're not looking for more. And inherently, we know when I do have patients that do take pills and they do tell me that it helps them, they know that it's not good for them. They know that that's going somewhere. Your liver is detoxifying and it's putting stress on the kidneys. And, Sorry. you know, you know that there's not good things. So at the end of the day, what do you do to test for food sensitivities? You have to test them. And those tests many times aren't, t aren't, aren't, paid for by insurance. What I'll tell patients that don't want to spend the test, which is fine, is get off those foods for 30 days. The best, the best test out there to find if you're sensitive to foods is get off the foods for 60, 90 days. And then what you do is you introduce it. You introduce one food and then you feel sick, then you know you have to be off of it. Almost done here, guys. You guys are hanging in there. Poor gut function. We, we've already talked about this. Bad gut function means bad brain function. I think Vincent looked ahead and, and got me right ahead to where we are. What's different pro problem? Can I just interrupt you? When, when I was younger, my grandmother, if you were not feeling well, and I'm sure a lot of grandmothers in this room, were, and they are grandmothers now, were not, or whatever. First thing, the gra you get a cold, your grandmother would say, what's the first thing she would say? And you relax it up. You need a give them a laxative, see what happens. Right, right. Gastro oil. Gastro oil, right. Or the, or the, I, I remember that would get whatever you had out of you, right? My, my friend next door to me was Polish. The grandmother would, he needs to push pipe. The push pipe. The push pipe. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then and they say, clear out his stomach and right. everything will be fine. And really, we're going. We're kind of going back. But you know what? Here's the thing. Um, Life's different than it was when they were when they were our age. I mean, we're more toxins than ever, right? This is one of the things I talk about. I mean, we didn't have cell phones, right? So how good is it? I have this little thing on the back of my cell phone that helps reduce the. This is a little microwave, and so if I have it here on my body at all day, all time, how healthy is that for me? It's not good. So we don't. We have number one more toxins in our environment than we ever had. Number two, we didn't have the wheat that we had then that we have now. It's been genetically modified. Um, farmers want to make more profits with less money so they put sprays and pesticides and chemicals and pollutants in the air and so our immune system is more stressed than it ever has been. So it would be nice to get the push pipe out but all of a sudden we've passed this point of, of no return where I don't mean to be like the sky is falling but really there's more toxicities than we've ever had. 
you know. And it's not going away. It's, 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 it's past. It's going to escalate. It's, it's, getting it's getting worse. Although I do have hope in that there are certain things that you can do naturally to eliminate your your exposures. You, you, you people say eat the healthy food, you know, organic. You know. It's still, but it's still, you're, you're, you're going to still wash yourself. It's, you know, I say, water's gonna happen. true, it's little hinges, little hinges swing big doors. So small little ch changes that you make cumulatively over time are going to make a big effect, a big effect. Otherwise, let's just give up now and say, screw it, we're, we're, we're doomed. I mean, we're here with some hope, right? Um, so, so gut infections. Um, brain inflammation, we said it, if there's inflammation in the gut, there's inflammation in the brain. Uh, causes of brain inflammation, high, high carb diets, poor circulation, gut function, leaky gut, high cortisol, high homocysteine. I can't tell you how many times I don't see this on a test. No one does their homocysteine. So one of the blood tests that I want to see is your homocysteine. What is it? It's a marker of inflammation. It tells you about cardiovascular function and it tells you if you're inflamed. And so typically we want to see it low that lower than 9.0 and I see people that are 11, 15, 20, 50 and they have inflammation in their body and they're not going to get any help until they figure out what is causing the inflammation in their body. Well, and so is it the same as the no, it's different. It's another inflammatory marker. C-reactive protein is another one. Homocysteine, uric acid. There's a bunch of different ones that you look at and you can tell if there's inflammation in the body. Remember, your brain doesn't want inflammation. It's like a blowtorch. It's a leaky gut, gut syndrome. What is it? Yeah. It's when we have inflammation in our gut and then what we used to be able to digest is no longer being digested. The best way of, of explaining it is we have a fine metal strainer that we, that we put pasta in and then the water falls through and the pasta stays there. Then you turn that into a colander and then the water goes through and so does the pasta. That's a leaky gut. That's what it is. Next slide. Neurotransmitters, um, anyone on SSRIs, uh, selective reuptake inhibitors? All right, so um, basically you have these chemicals that are happy peptides in the brain. Dopamine, GABA, serotonin, and they need to be functioning optimally for proper brain function. They're chemicals that tell our brain what to do and when to do it. And if they're not working properly because of everything we've talked about, then you're going to have some of these changes. So if you look on the back of the other form, it's called the GFAF. Uh, do we have another one or no? No, I just have this. Okay. She, she gives two things. Oh, yeah. Okay, maybe you're missing it. Okay, no problem. So I have that when you come in to see me. I'll give you an offer here at the end. Um, I have you fill that out and that will give me an idea as to if you have neurotransmitter deficiencies. And a lot of patients do have that. Almost done here. Um, so there's different neurotransmitters responsible for memory, for satisfaction, for motivation, for, for anti-anxiety. And you need a proper balance of those in order for you to be healthy. What can affect it? All these medications and hormones and leaky gut. So you'll see a couple trends. All these things that cause all these deficiencies need to be addressed. Hormonal imbalances, that's a big one. Uh, all hormone productions are affected by cholesterol. Who here is on cholesterol lowering medication? Okay, so a lot of the time what's happening is your cholesterol is too low and you're not absorbing enough cholesterol and your cholesterol makes hormones. That's a very controversial statement, I know. But you know what? 15, 25 years ago when they said we're going to get rid of all heart disease and we're going to get everyone on cholesterol lowering medication, now 25 years later there's more incidence of cardiovascular disease than ever. So it's not the cholesterol's problem, it's the inflammation problem. Oh, really? So if we didn't have inflammation, cholesterol, in, in Mediterranean societies their cholesterol levels are 320. Yet they don't have the same heart disease that we have here. Why is that? Because it's inflammation. So it's not the cholesterol that's the problem. Many times when I look at your blood tests, I see your cholesterol is too low. It shouldn't be below 150. And if it's below 150, then you're going to have problems making hormones. And hormones are needed for your brain to function properly. So that's a big one. I told you I was going to give you a lot of information. But can you control with uh, the right food? 
cholesterol. Yeah, in fact, you should you should eat more fatty uh, fatty acids that are healthy. Fatty acids. Essential fatty acids. So, like, I think that egg yolks are okay. Mm -hmm. uh, healthy, like coconut oils, mm -hmm. are okay. Uh, olive oil, not heated. I don't think it's good. Mm -hmm. Avocado, healthy nuts. All of these things will help your essential fatty acids go up, and you need those. Fat burns fat. That's the thing. All right. Um, toxins in your brain. We already talked a little bit about more toxic world than we've ever had. Um, that will create a lot of problems with your brain. So, so you need a proper immune system, you need a proper liver, and you need proper texting, testing. Two-thirds of your toxin can be avoided by eating organically. You talked a little bit about that earlier. So it's a big problem. You need to get over that. You need to accept it already, Vincent. And you need to. You need you can't to change the world. You've got to live in it. Small hinges swing big doors, right? That's the answer. Proper brain activation. We already talked about what the brain does and what you can do to stimulate it. And so, what do we do with proper activation? We'll tell you right now. The traditional medicine for brain base is counseling, exercise, music, hobbies, and sleep. So those are all kind of good. Um, but in the office, we do a lot of different brain exercises. So we do eye movements, stimulate your eyes to move in certain directions, to focus different parts of your brain. We do eye lights, so we put different lights in the eyes. Vibration is very important. We get you moving while we look at you do different exercises. Balancing. Playing ping pong stimulates Very good. It's very good. Yeah, it's very good. Yep, deep breathing exercises, um, lots of different things that you can do in, the ex in, in that. And also we need to get what we talked about earlier. We need to get proper glucose, proper oxygen, proper neurotransmitters, and reduce inflammation. These are the causes of your problems. And the brain is very, very plastic, meaning you can stimulate change in your brain. There's hope. You can, you can do this. All right, but you need these basics. So what's next? What I want you to do is I do a two-visit um, workup. On visit one, I do a complete neurological examination. So those functional neurological examinations. And I tell patients alone, if I don't feel I can help you, I'll give you your, your money back. If, I, if, you, if you guys do an exam, a neurological exam, and you say it's like in a neurological exam that you've done elsewhere, I'll give you your money back. Because I do believe that the examination I do, it's like no other test that you've done. We test your smells, we test your balance, we test your coordination, we touch your sensory perception, we test your eye movements. We do a lot of different tests that I know that you haven't had done before. Um, I also get you to fill out these assessment forms and then I go over what we just did in this presentation and what's in this book and I'll say, okay, Vincent, looks like you have stress that's contributing to it. Your neurotransmitters are not focusing properly. You have um, inflammation in the brain. You have sugar levels that need to be addressed and here's what we need to do to fix that. So that's what we do on day one. I'll also give you a copy of the book too. Um, I suggest that typically you be with a spouse or a loved one because if you're not, then they're not going to see the, the, the importance of what's going on with your body. When I do a test on you and your spouse sees, like here, you see, there's a little X on the floor back there. And one of the tests that I do on that floor test is I do the 50 step test. So we close our eyes and we march in place for 50 times. I don't want you to move from that X. Then we open your eyes and we see if you're at that same X. I can't tell you how many times the person opens your eyes. Do you feel like you're on the same step? Yep, I do. And they look and they're like, oh my goodness. When your spouse sees that, then they know that, wow, I didn't realize this was going on with you. Or, you know, let me, I'm going to touch two fingers here, Valerie, and I want you to tell me how many fingers are between the fingers that I touched. And they'll say zero. And, and there's one. Mm -hmm. So you're not being able to identify certain touches. Very important for the spouse to see this. Um, because then they realize that there's something going on. Uh, visit two, I go over um, the ins and outs of your case. So whether we need to do further testing. You know, if you have adrenal gland problems, then we may want to do a salivary test to check out what's going on with your adrenal glands. If we're concerned with your immune system and, and gluten, we may want to do gluten testing. 
So there's certain testing that I do after. I go over your neurological findings. I'll say, Vincent, you have a right brain deficiency. You can't feel the, your toes. You also have a parietal lobe problem. On the left, we also have a cerebellar problem. Here's what we need to do to fix that. Um, we go over the treatment plan. And I also, on day one, want you to leave me your insurance. I'll tell you how much it will cover based on some of the therapies we do in the office. And again, I want to, you to be with the spouse on that one as well. Let me just go over a couple of things, last minute things. Oops. Um, what I need you to do is bring a shorts and a t-shirt, have all the paperwork completed, and the spouse be there with you guys. Um, I typically work with different cases. I work with thyroid cases, peripheral neuropathy cases, IBS and Crohn cases, and brain cases. I accept five new brain cases per month, and the typical workup for, for, for two visits would be 450 but because you attended this workshop, then I do it for $75, and that includes both, both tests. So day one and day two. In fact, I even want you to bring in your blood tests so that I can review those and tell you if I see something there on a functional scale. And that, I'll also give you this book too. So it's a good value for you guys. Um, also, if I feel I can't help you, um, or I, you, know, you feel like this neurological exam was kind of crappy and you, you've seen better, then I'll give you your money back. I really will. So I think that that is worth, worth your, your time. A couple of things though that I want to say, because I do have a couple rules, um, you have to be willing to make some changes. Now, one of the things that I tell patients is my office, it's not an emergency room. And so I don't just take anyone who comes in. If you have a bad attitude, a lot of the times the spouse comes in, the husband comes in, and they'll sit there like this, you know, and I don't believe a word that you're saying and that this, that, and the other. And I'm like, I already know that I don't want to take this as a case. If you're going to be a PIA, you know, then, then I'm not going to take this as a case. If you don't want to make some changes, I don't want to care more for your condition than you are. I'll care a lot about what you're doing, and that's why I do this, because I want to educate you and, and help you and, and turn on a light bulb and make you realize that there's more going on than just taking, you know, your, your mood disorder pills. Um, but you have to make some changes. And, and also, you have to take accountability for your health. Um, I tell patients that it would be great if insurance paid for all of it, um, but insurance doesn't pay for all of it. Insurance is like car insurance. Insurance will pay if you get in a car accident, but if you have a transmission problem or oil change problem or pay for, the, you know, for gas, it's not going to fix those things. And that's how insurance is as well with healthcare. Um, Medicare or insurance will pay some of the portions of the exercises that we do in the office but it doesn't pay for all of it. And so what I tell patients is I make it affordable by doing different care plans. And so if you can afford 200 to 400 per month, somewhere in that area, when I tell patients for financed for 10 to 12, 20 months in that area there, then you could afford my protocol. That's, that's basically what you're looking at. So I want patients to know on day two, when we sit down and we go over our finances, I don't want you to tell me, okay, I gotta go home and think about it, because I didn't know. I told you we were gonna be somewhere in that area there, and I don't want to waste your time, and I don't want you to waste my time, but that's what we're looking at to, to cover. There's no surprise there. Um, so that's just my open disclaimer. And, um, and we do do financing, so it, you know, if, if someone does a third party finance, then, then they qualify for that, then they can spread the payments out. Um, I went the wrong way. My brain's tired. On a scale of one to 10, think about how serious it is. You know, I get to this point and some people don't realize that there's some big problems. Um, how has it affected your relationship and your ability to enjoy your life? On a scale of one to 10, how serious? I try to make it so that you're at least an eight on how serious you are on what's going wrong. If you're not, then good. You're not as in such a bad condition. You don't need to be here. But if you find that you're not where you need to be and it's serious, then this program, and it r makes sense to you. You know, this, what I've said, is resonates with you that I ask you to do something about it. And, and that's really it. So if we have any questions for me, um, let me know now. If not, then I have Sydney and David up at the front desk and they could reserve a time for you and give you a book. Okay, I'm gonna go through that.